Today I am angry because a Dutch college student has slandered me in our hobby and implies that breeding butterflies and moths is illegal and unethical. In the newspaper. Today I am a little bit angry because the Dutch newspaper published an article about our hobby, breeding butterflies and moths. And it was a very negative article that implies that what butterfly and moth breeders are doing is unethical and maybe even illegal. I am open to criticism. I think it's a good idea when we ask relevant ethical questions and look at ourselves like, is what we are doing, is it right? Is it ethical? But my problem with this article is not that it criticizes us, but that it uses outright misinformation and lies to criticize this hobby. And I am going to debunk everything in this video and I will prove to you that the person who has written this article, Sonja Pleumakers, aspiring journalist in the Netherlands, is not an ethical or professional journalist and I will prove it to you. Let's get started. I have all the evidence here. But before that, I'm going to explain to you why we breed butterflies and moths and what makes it so interesting. Before we criticize the article and what's incorrect about it, I want to explain to you the background. What does this hobby mean and why are people doing it? First of all, let's talk about insects. Did you know that over 40% of all insect species on the world have declined in numbers and that one third of all insect species are threatened in their existence? This is extremely concerning because about 75% to 95% of all plants on planet Earth are pollinated by insects. Plants are responsible for producing the oxygen we breathe the food that we eat and even retaining drinkable water in the soil with their roots. Without plants, there would be no life, no ecosystem. And without insects, there would be no plants, or almost no plants, that is, mainly the angiosperms, but whatever. It would be very problematic for humanity and the planet as a whole if we continue to drive insects extinct like this. So why are insects declining and going extinct like this? Well, there's many, many scientific studies on this subject. And they all come down to the same reasons. Urbanization, deforestation, agriculture, and in particular modern agriculture, and over-exploitation of the earth. The widespread use of harsh pesticides that are unregulated and drive multiple insect species extinct. Not to mention climate change. The climate is changing in many ways. That, so that it becomes unsuitable for many species, driving them instinct, extinct. And let's not forget the fact that there is massive degradation of the habitats of these insects. We are effectively ruining their homes. Now this is not controversial. There are many scientific studies who are proving this point, And every entomologist will agree with me. However, a more subtle existential threat to insects is not just climate change and pollution and pesticide and agriculture, it's us and our ignorance of insects. Our ignorance of insects is an existential threat to them. Did you know that in the tropical regions of the world, we, who are the most biodiverse, between 70 and 90 percent of the life cycles of local butterflies and moths, but also other insects, are completely unknown to science? This is not acceptable. If we want to protect insects, if we want to conserve insects, yes, insect conservation, we have to know how they live in the wild, what they eat. You know, for many butterflies and moths, it is not known what they eat in the wild. How can you protect a species if you don't know what it eats? If you don't know what it requires to survive? You don't know. So. While we are driving them extinct, we don't even have the knowledge about them to preserve them. That's ridiculous. And this is why I started breeding butterflies and moths. Because by looking at them in the wild and in captivity, you can learn so much about their biology and it helps their conservation. Many people call me a YouTuber. YouTuber Bart Coppens. Yeah, YouTube is fun, it's entertainment, but I am more than a YouTuber. This is a scientific entomological journal. And when we open it, 
we see a scientific article published by Bart Coppens. Can you see it? It is the life history of a moth species from a country of which very little was known. And by breeding these animals in captivity, I have brought new scientific information to light about their development, what they eat, how long it takes them to grow, and I figured all of this stuff out by breeding them in captivity. This is why breeding butterflies and moths in captivity is a good thing. It contributes to the knowledge, the very simple knowledge that is missing, that we need in order to conserve them. My videos have been watched by millions of people on the internet. My vi videos have educated probably collectively millions of people who clicked on them and learned something new about these insects. But on top of that, over the course of seven years, I have published hundreds of life cycles of butterflies and moths. I have documented them on the internet, on my website, on my YouTube channel. And all of this, undoubtedly, while it's hard to quantify how much it has helped, I have no doubt in my mind that me and my work have contributed to the conservation of these animals. No doubt. And butterfly farms and zoos are effectively doing the same. They're educating the public. It doesn't matter if you write a book about butterflies, if you make a video about butterflies, if you write about them, photograph them, film them, you breed them, you make a butterfly farm. All these people are making a positive contribution. So when a Dutch newspaper or more or less a journalist called Sonja Pleumakers contacted me to talk about my hobby and how it works, I was quite excited. I was, yay, finally, our hobby is getting a little bit attention in the media. But what resulted from this was outright slander. And I'm going to explain to you why I think this is an outright lie, what I have written. The article is called Three Seconds Inspection and the butterfly pupa have been sent into the country in Dutch. Drie seconden inspectie en de vlinderpoppen zijn het land in. And it explains, it tries to portray the butterfly breeding hobby and butterfly farming as something unethical that is completely unregulated. But what's crazy is while it tries to criticize, I'll put an, a link to the article below in the comments, an English and a Dutch version, so you can read it yourself and make up your mind. But in order to criticize how the uh, protective measures that prevent people from smuggling and poaching rare species are failing, it only uses one protective measure as an example, called CITES. CITES is mentioned seven times in the article. This is bizarre because the article fails to measure, mention any other protective measures. And here's the crazy thing. CITES is not even a protective measure, it's a trade agreement. Let me explain to you briefly what it is and why this article makes no sense. Now I have written this down, but I'm going to read it out loud, but the main protective measure that is constantly mentioned in the article over seven times is CITES. Curiously, the CITES Convention, or the Convention on International Trade, in Endangered Species of Wildlife, Flora and Fauna is an international trade agreement signed in 1975 that has been signed and enforced by over 183 countries worldwide. CITES is only limited to the international trade in protected species and not on-site conservation. This is my criticism, and I've written some of it down, so I don't have to read it from the top of my head. I, my native language is not English, so sometimes I struggle being eloquent. And if I want to be more eloquent, I, I prefer to write my text down and read it out loud. But this is my criticism. Curiously, is that worldwide, there are one, over 180,000 species of butterflies and moths, of which only about 50 are protected under the CITES agreement. To illustrate the problem, and this is my text, it means that worldwide, less than 0.027% of all known species of butterflies and moths are protected by CITES, as of the current year 2021. Even if we just single out butterflies and not moths, 
there are about one, uh, 17, uh, 1700 uh, species that have been described. Well, it's uh, 1,500 species. And we discovered that only about 0.03% of all species, or sorry, 0.3% of all species fall under CITES protection. So this trade agreement, it doesn't even pertain to half a percent of all the species of butterflies and moths in the world, but it's used as the only example of a protective measure that exists. It is completely wrong and misleading, and I will explain to you why. Stay watching, keep watching, you're gonna learn something new today. Why is a trade agreement that is irrelevant to 99.7% of all the species being used as the main example to show how protective measures are failing. It's a trade agreement. It makes no sense and it doesn't even pertain to the vast majority of species. For example, in the Netherlands alone, dozens of species and butterflies and moths are protected under the national flora and fauna law called the Flora and Fauna Wet. This law has nothing to do with CITES in my country. Nothing. But yet, it is another protective measure that pre prevents people like me from breeding certain species in captivity. And every country in the world has its own equivalent of these laws. For example, did you know that, for example, the Spanish moon moth is a protected species in some countries in Europe? Or that in the country of Thailand, all species of moon moth are protected by law, but not in the Netherlands. Which means that if you live in one of these countries, it would be illegal for you to breed or collect any of these species in captivity, or trade them or send them abroad to butterfly farms. Why is this being ignored? Because journalist Sonja, who tries to be an investigative journalist, is not interested in this subject. She is not interested in actually investigating the subject and learning more about it. She is more interested in finding something to criticize. After a level of protection that species enjoy legally on an individual level, there's also other indirect protective measures that prevent certain species from being uh, collected, traded or caught. For example, one of the rarest moths in Europe the Italian owlet moth, Acanto Brahmaia europaea, I've done an episode about this species on my channel, is one of the rarest species in the world, and amazingly, it's not a protected species by law. So technically, it's not illegal to catch them, except that most of their habitat, the area where they live in the wild, has been declared to be a natural, um, natural reserve. It is called Riserve Naturale Orientata Grotticelle in Italian, or Grotticelle Natural Reserve. Because the land is protected here, it would be illegal for anybody to catch and collect these animals in a, in a protected natural reserve. And there's many examples of this worldwide. Sometimes threatened species are not protected by the law, but the area that they live in, the land that they live in, is protected which still makes it illegal for you to catch, to breed, or poach any one of them. This is once again not mentioned in the article, and it only uses scientists repeatedly, repeatedly, to criticize our hobby. And how it criticizes it, I will explain to you later, okay? But first, you need to have this background um, information before we read the article and debunk all of its claims. But. What about other protective measures like the European Habitat Directive? The European Habitat Directive is a legal initiative in Europe which gives certain species protection on a European level, which again would make it illegal to sell or trade them. All of these details and the whole legal framework behind her hobby are completely left out in our article. Why did they leave out all this information? just because they want to portray our hobby in a negative light. That's the only thing they're interested in. Besides the law, there are also extra legal preventive measures that prevent people from unethically trading butterflies and moths. Did you know that most butterfly farms in the world are part of something that is called 
the International Association of Butterfly Exhibitors and Suppliers, or known as IABUS, which is more or less a self-regulating network of which most butterfly farms are a member and it regulates the supply chain and makes butterfly houses pledge to voluntarily become a part of a self-regulating network of suppliers of butterfly and moth pupa with restrictions play pertaining to ethics and sustainability. So a lot of butterfly and moth farms are voluntarily part of a, a network in which they pledge to follow certain uh, rules and agreements. This is not a legal protective measure, but it is a protective measure that um, basically regulates how butterfly farms can trade animals worldwide, what species, pledging to conservation and sustainability. Second of all, we must ask ourselves, is breeding butterflies and moths harmful to their conservation? A ridiculous question, in my opinion, and only a question that a journalist would take seriously. Now the following argument that I have against this text I've written down because it's a complex argument and if I uh, say English from the top of my mind sometimes I get lost in my train of thought because it's difficult to speak two languages. I am born Dutch, my mother tongue is Netherlands, so it's difficult. So I've written down my argument, but it is not surprising that the vague implication that breeding butterflies or moths is harmful to the conservation of these animals is a poorly construed conjecture, considering there is no scientific evidence to suggest that breeding butterflies and moths in captivity endangers them. Between 1890 in my country and uh, 2017, the number of butterfly species in my country, the Netherlands, declined by 84% of which 50 species have completely disappeared from the Netherlands permanently. Important to understand is that multiple scientific studies have researched this decline and show that the main reason for this decline is due to intensive agriculture, extensive use of pesticides, nitrogen pollution, urbanization and the degradation of suitable habitats. The practice of catching or breeding butterflies is nowhere mentioned as a contributing or even significant factor in their worldwide decline. But as usual, it's the butterfly enthusiasts who, like me, who are expected to carry the blame for this decline, instead of the large structural socio-economic problems that we have created as a society and have collectively destroyed nature. This is once again a case of enthusiasts like me taking the blame for something massive corporations have essentially done, despite there not being any scientific evidence to suggest that in any country in the whole world, butterfly or moth breeders of collectors have ever contributed to the extinction of a species. Ever. Sonia, what are you doing? You call yourself a journalist. But now, now here we are with the direct quotes from the newspaper article. Here is a direct translated quote from an insect e expert in Costa Rica. <clears throat> nobody, nobody has any insight when it comes to the thousands of butterflies that are not on the CITES list. More than a health inspection from the veterinarian of the Netherlands Food and Consumer Product Safety Authority is not required. This is a bad thing, according to the Costa Rican insect expert Luis Murillo Hiller. The CITES list is incomplete. In the middle American country, where a large part of the Dutch butterfly import comes from, there are thousands of species of butterflies and moths, of which we have no clue in what numbers they persist in the wild. Too little research is being done. Murillo Hiller found over 16 butterfly species that, according to him, are vulnerable and should be protected, but are not on the CITES list. So this insect expert from Costa Rica, that tells you something about the absolute state of Costa Rican education, yikes, is implying that because certain species are not protected by CITES, and are exported to the Netherlands to show in butterfly farms, this is somehow harming their conservation in the wild. What? 
And here is my criticism of this statement. It is hard to imagine that any serious insect expert with academic credentials would support such a statement. The CITES convention only pertains itself to the international trade of animals, not on-site conservation. The implication that any butterfly species are vulnerable and protected, and that they would benefit from trade restrictions, considering there is no scientific evidence to suggest that people breeding and exporting butterflies even remotely poses an existential threat to them is absurd. While collectors and breeders are often implicated with the decline of certain butterfly species, this is an uneducated take that diverts the public attention away from mountains of evidence to suggest that exponential deforestation and use of pesticides are systematically driving species extinct. Meanwhile, Costa Rica's use of pesticide is greater than all of the countries in Central America combined. According to the data by the Regional Institute of Studies of Toxic Substances, the IRED, of the National University in Costa Rica, I hope you go to university, because it doesn't sound like you went there, the country uses on average an alarming 80.2 kilograms of pesticide per hectare of cropland. Costa Rica is systematically driving species extinct with their insane immune, insane amount of pesticide. But this insect expert implies that the number of species is threatened because of a dozen of butterfly farms in his country who are shipping pupa abroad. Pupa of butterflies, which mind you, are mostly bred in captivity. They are not even taken from the wild in most cases, but ranched or raised in captivity. Otherwise, it's impossible to ship thousands of pupa. It's not sustainable or not even possible to collect that many livestock from the wild and ship it on a consistent basis, unless you're breeding them. Not to mention you need exp export permits to export certain species that don't even pertain to CITES. Oh, by the way, there are zero butterfly species in Costa Rica that fall under the CITES trade agreement. How is this person even an academic? Man, my local garbage man probably has more academic knowledge than you. There is no evidence to suggest endangered butterfly species are systematically and consistently being exported by butterfly houses and butterfly farms in Costa Rica, nor that butterfly rearing practices endanger local fauna. We can only hope to give Louis Murillo Hiller the benefit of the doubt, for perhaps he was persuaded into saying this by the interviewers, which in case it would be more of a testament to Louis' level of agreeability than the absolute state of education in Costa Rica. Oh, but we're not finished yet. I'm just getting started because I enjoy tearing this bullshit apart. I've also written this. The constant emphasis on CITES throughout this article is more than inappropriate, considering it pertains to less than 0.3% of all butterfly species worldwide, considering how it barely contributes to species conservation and how it, there is no evidence to uh, prove any species are declining or threatened due to captive rearing of butterflies. The article also implies many protected species are being regularly imported. And here's a nice direct quote from the newspaper article. Some specialist inspectors of the customs office in the Netherlands Food and Customer Product Safety Authority do have the knowledge for that. I doubt it. But because butterflies enter the country as pupa, it's impossible to recognize the protected species, said ja Jaap Reingoud, CITES consultant and former Netherlands Food and Consumer uh, Safety Authority inspector. In reality, you can only identify them once they have hatched and when they, once they've already reached the customer. So what Jaap is saying is that our government does have the uh, knowledge to identify protected species, but they don't have the knowledge to identify protected species. Because they enter the country as pupa, and they don't have the knowledge to identify protected species as pupa. Hey, I have an idea. 
Why don't you hire me as your inspector? I would do a better job than you. While it's true that many Cites species, including many Troidini bird wings, are morphologically almost identical to non-protected species, the emphasis on Cites is once again inappropriate. The implication that protected species are frequently being farmed and imported, and that this is a detriment to their conservation, while the CITES agreement does not even protect 99.7% of all species of butterflies and moths worldwide, which makes it practically useless for conservation, is ridiculous. On top of that, butterfly farms, as I've mentioned, have their own import and export permits, regulations, European protection laws, national protection laws, extra-legal protective measures, the veterinarian check that is just mentioned, and um, networks such as IABES. This whole article is a testament to the journalist Lisa Gertz, Sonja Pleumakers and Samet Yimas unwillingness to immerse themselves in a subject matter beyond the, beyond the most superficial levels of understanding. These journalists have failed to touch upon even the smallest surface area when it comes to the protective, um, protective measures that are in place to prevent smuggle and illegal imports. They've only looked at one single protective measure that doesn't even do what they think it does. It makes no sense. Why would somebody want to, write, want to write an article in a newspaper about a subject that you don't even want to research? It makes no sense. This is like me writing an article in a newspaper about, oh, the traffic laws in the Netherlands are inadequate because 10% of the traffic lights are broken. Okay, maybe that's a problem. What about the uh, thousands of other speeding laws there are, you know? You just forget to look at the whole legal framework and instead focus on one tiny detail. It makes no sense. Here's another nice quote from the article. Farmers don't receive any training. They often can't tell protected or unprotected species apart. Now, I've worked on butterfly farms and trained people there, and I know this for a fact is an outright lie. Source, I trained people to recognize protected species. But let's ignore this fact because it's anecdotal evidence and maybe, pff, maybe they found evidence to the contrary. Let's give them the benefit to the doubt of the doubt, even though they've uh, proved several times their incompetence as journalists, but let's assume that this statement is somehow accurate and uh, they found evidence for it. And it's still baffling, considering the article mentions many countries such as Kenya and Costa Rica that do not contain any situs protected butterfly species at all. Let me ask you a question, Sonia. Have you looked at the amount of butterfly species that are protected by CITES and where they live? No, you haven't. Not surprising for a journalist. We wouldn't expect journalists to get their facts right, of course. The truth is, <coughs> no butterfly species are recognized in Africa or the entire continental landmass of South America, with the exception of a, of a species in the Caribbean, which makes the chance of any butterfly farm from there incidentally exporting a butterfly species 0%. Despite the majority of butterfly pupa being imported from these destinations, the article mentioned it itself that the majority of pupa are imported from Africa and Costa Rica, and that it's a problem that people don't know how to recognize protected species, while there are no protected species that you cannot ship in these regions. While arguing that these species should be protected under a trade agreement, that perfects, prevents people from training them without a permit, without looking at a legal framework. That makes no sense. CITES is merely a trade agreement that does not forbid farmers from capturing any species. It merely protects people from selling and trading them without permits. How can you use quotes from insect experts Claiming, claiming that many species are threatened 
and don't have any protective measures. And oh no, they're not protected by CITES. Well, CITES does nothing to, to guarantee their, their local conservation. It only prevents selling and trading, import and export of species that are already being farmed in captivity. Well, you're not even showing any evidence that breeding them does anything harmful to their conservation at all. There is no evidence in this whole article. How can you write this down? I just don't understand. Now let me ask you a question. Does butterfly breeding deserve support? Undoubtedly, the practice of breeding butterflies and moths has positively contributed to our knowledge of these animals. I showed you the article I published. I published many new scientific informations about butterflies and moths that will help their conservation. I'm more than just a YouTuber, you know. But I'm not the only breeder that exists. For example, many big entomological works, such as Saturnine of the World, Powen's Finner Der Welt, by Rudolf E. Lamp, rely on the contributions of hobbyists and breeders to illustrate the life history of hundreds of species, but also the plants that they eat in the wild, for example. The butterflies that you see in a butterfly garden are often reared in captivity and shipped to Europe as pupa. In developing countries, this makes people financially dependent on local butterfly fauna in a sustainable way. A lack of butterflies for these people means a lack of income. Thus the local biodiversity is preserved. An attractive alternative to deforestation and agriculture. Butterfly farms contribute to the conservation of these animals and their environment and offer an alternative to development. It's true, I've been in Cambodia. Cambodia was 80% deforested. But where we have the butterfly farm, we are planting trees. Planting trees because then the people will have more butterflies around them to breed. And when they breed these butterflies, they only produce more of them. A part of them are released so that there is more sustainable breeding stock for later and more are exported to Europe. If the area was deforested, which happens there a lot, for agriculture, to farm cows, to farm rice instead, then these people would not have an income. Instead of earning money from destroying the environment in a country riddled, riddled with poverty, they are earning money by preserving it. But I guess if you are somebody like Sonia, you are too short-sighted to see any of this, or even research the possibility or the ways it may contribute, because you are only selectively looking for things that support your shallow, sensationalistic point of view. And what I've written down is that reason alone makes it regrettable that Lise Geurts, Sonja Pleumakers and Samet Yimas have decided to, in, the, um, in their attempts to complete their college assignment, because they are just students writing an article for a newspaper, paper, have chosen to portray butterfly farming in a negative light, based on a superficial and shallow level of understanding of the subject matter. I don't understand why is it possible for a journalist to write an article in several weeks' time poorly researching the actual subject while glossing over the actual facts. Is this normal in journalism? Even worse is that I am included in this newspaper. On 10 February 2011, the journalist contacted me on Facebook. I was approached by the journalist named Sonja Pleumakers, an UVA student in journalism and redactor of Newsuur. And on Facebook she sent me the message, Bart, I am a journalism student on the University of Amsterdam and I am currently working on an investigative journalism project about butterfly farms in the Netherlands. When I called the Dutch butterfly conservation, they referred to me as an expert of breeding exotic butterflies. I'd like to know more about it. Thank you, Dutch Butterfly Conservation, and I mean it. I'm actually proud that the Dutch Butterfly Conservation referred to me as an expert and told uh, them to contact me. That's actually generally a good thing. It means the National Butterfly Conservation recognizes me and my work. Unfortunately, it resulted in Sonja writing negatively about me. 
after a two hour long conservation with this journalist, in which I shared the ins and outs voluntarily of the butterfly trade, breeding and importing butterflies, I was more than disappointed to find out that from this two hour conservation with me, she had only singled out a single one of my quotes. And this is what they put in the newspaper about me. YouTuber Coppens knows how easy it is to smuggle butterfly eggs of rare species from vacation. You can simply put them in the pocket of your coat, he said, or you ship them in a straw inside an envelope. Legally sending eggs is expensive. Bart knows a lot of collectors and breeders that don't co declare them. And this quote is indeed mine, but it's completely ripped out of context. And this looks terrible for me. For example, I would like to use the trade in second-hand goods as an example. Each time that you buy second-hand goods, there is a tiny but a very real possibility that these goods may have been stolen. A lot of people steal items and sell them to pawn shops. When you buy second-hand goods, there is no way you can rule out or guarantee that they haven't been stolen and everybody who has ever gone to a pawn shop will agree. Pawn shops sell a lot of second-hand items because they buy them from random strangers. And it's impossible to know if these items were legit or if they were stolen and sold to the pawn shop, right? And the trade in animals and butterflies and moths is similar. Whether or not you buy a lizard, a parrot, a snake or a turtle, it's often impossible to make sure that these animals were transported to Europe legally. It's true. The fact that this po possibility exists does not mean you uh, voluntarily participate in it or advocate for it. While it's true that when it comes to the captive breeding of butterflies, sometimes species are being traded which are wild caught, the quotation YouTuber Coppens knows how easy it is to smuggle butterfly eggs of rare species from vacation. You can simply put them in the pocket of your coat or ship them in a straw inside an envelope. Legally sending butterfly eggs is expensive. Bart knows a lot of butterfly collectors and breeders that don't declare them is an incriminating quote and it implies I participate in breaking the law. But not everybody who buys second-hand goods is a criminal. If you are aware that when you buy second-hand stuff from a pawn shop, it can be potentially stolen. Would you imply that everybody who buys stuff from a pawn shop is a criminal? Would you word this as Bart Coppens knows how easy it is to steal second-hand goods? He and his friends buy them all the time. Just because I went to a pawn shop and because I recognize the possibility exists that when you buy items from a pawn shop there is a small possibility they were not acquired legally. Does that mean I voluntarily participate in the stealing of these objects? Of course not. So why would you rephrase this in a newspaper as Bart Coppens knows how easy it is to smuggle uh, and steal these things? Yeah, I know how easy it is. But it sounds like here I'm talking from experience, which is not true. It's like everybody knows how easy it is to steal stuff and sell it to a pawn shop, which results to innocent people inadvertently and accidentally buying stolen items. Does that mean that everybody who buys secondhand stuff online is a criminal? No, it means there is for everybody who buys secondhand stuff there is a small possibility that you cannot rule out the fact that it, it was um, obtained legally. That doesn't mean you would like to frame them as somebody who smuggles items. This can have negative consequences for me, for my channel and for this hobby. And it's a take that is complete, completely taken out of context, which was the context of me recognizing that yes, perhaps there is a, a somewhat of a missing legal framework. That doesn't mean that I voluntarily participate and have knowledge of people stealing, the, stealing stuff or breaking the law or smuggling animals. This is implying I break the law. In the newspaper, 
And the fact that this is the only quote she used for me after a two hour interview that I voluntarily gave to this journalist and she only uses, chooses to use one of my quotes which makes me look bad it makes me think that she selectively singled out this quote just to portray me as a bad person who has experience with smuggling animals. And what's even worse is that the original wording of the article was even more bad. The original quote was Bart Coppens knows how easy it is to smuggle eggs from the airport and his friends do it often. This is not a lie, this is what she wanted to put in a newspaper first but I complained and I prevented it, so she slightly changed the text. It still makes me look bad right now, but the original text was much worse. This is literally a quote. Bart Coppens knows how easy it is to smuggle eggs from the airport. And his friends do it often. Why would I say this to a journalist? I didn't! This is what she inferred from the conversation I had with her when I said, I'm aware of the fact that in this hobby, when you go to the pet shop, when you buy a parrot, you hope that the parrot was acquired legally, but you cannot rule out it was perhaps part of the illegal animal trade. There is always a small possibility. And the way that Sonia would rephrase this is Bart knows how easy it is to smuggle parrots. He and his friend buy stolen parrots very often. This is the original way, the original thing she wanted to put in a newspaper. And after I complained several times about how incriminating and untrue this is, Sonia agreed that this was too much. And then she only slightly changed the way it was worded. After changing other details, such as my incorrect age. She said I was like 23 or 24 years old. I'm 28 years old. But that's a small detail. I don't care if a journalist has my age wrong. But I complained about how terrible this makes me look. Of course, the NRC Handelsblad and Sonja Pleumakers are free to publish any of my statements which I voluntarily shared with them. But the selective use of my quotes without context, despite my objections, as a person that they have interviewed, mind you, I share all this information for free because of, I'm passionate about the subject and they used it as a weapon against me. Even when it comes to the heavy implications of me breaking the law are a testament to a certain level of malicious intent by Sonia and provide evidence of the fact that the superficial level of interest that these reported ha reporters have in the subject of butterflies is merely subordinate to their desire to publish something controversial in the newspapers in order to receive attention. Don't forget, these people are students. They are not professional journalists. This was their first article in the newspaper. They had to write it for school and they were probably trying to be trained as investigative journalists and they think investigating something is the same as selectively choosing things that make it look bad and publishing it in the newspaper. Well, you know what, Sonia? Here is the attention that you desired and I'm going to give it to you. I'm just getting started. This video is going to be a part of many things I'm going to publish about you in return. If you have feel to have the freedom to write things about people in the newspapers, even despite their objections, then I am free to do the same about you. I am free to mention your name because a newspaper is public domain. But you made one mistake. My YouTube channel and my website gets more traffic than your newspaper article. Every month my channel gets over 200,000 views by people who watch my videos. And every month my website has 300 to 1,000 readers. And I will make sure that people will get to know about this thing that you've written about me. Because your career as a journalist is not very promising. If you think that journalism is the same as interviewing somebody for two hours and only picking out small parts of the con con uh, conversation, man, I keep making this mistake, in which you think it makes them look bad. But I can play the same game. And you know what? I'm very passionate about this and I'm not letting this go. 
Let's talk about the real conservation and protection of these animals that I care about. This is what I've written about them, it's also on my personal website, breedingbutterflies.com. That Sonja Pleumakers and the NRC Handelsblad have little interest in actually conserving butterflies. That's true, these journalists have no interest in conserving butterflies. They have more interest in publishing something controversial. When it comes to publishing, an article is obvious. For an article that pretends to have a critical look at butterfly free breeding and the impact it has on conservation, it fails to acknowledge any of the relevant protective measures apart from CITES. They only mention CITES seven times as evidence that the law is failing the conservation of butterflies. Well, they don't, don't even mention a single, single different law. They don't even attempt to quantify the detrimental impact that breeding has. So they claim something is bad, they imply it's bad without ever explaining why it's bad or using any evidence to back it up. If you think that butterfly farming is bad for butterflies, fine, prove it! Use evidence, you're a journalist, right? No wait, you're not a journalist. You don't deserve to have that title. The fact there is no mention of any legislation or protective measures that are in place, the fact that butterfly suppliers are required to have their own import and export permits in countries of destination and countries of origin in many cases. It took us two years on the butterfly farm where I worked to get an export permit from the country of Laos. The habitat protection that provides species endemic to these regions legal protection, the fact butterfly suppliers have self-regulating structures, the article brushes over all these things and anything that is remotely relevant in order to only focus on CITES legislation that is relevant in less than 0.027% of all species of butterflies and moths worldwide and is only a trade agreement not an in situ conservation measure, is a testament to the willful ignorance of this group of aspiring journalists and the NRC Handelsblatt. The level of this article is equal to something like climate change isn't real because it's snowing outdoors and medical masks don't work because I had to wear one and I still coughed. It's an article saturated with statements and facts that have been selectively mentioned in order to defend a certain point of view. The point of view that breeding butterflies and moths in captivity and the industry is rotten and that there is a world in which there is no emphasis or insight of what is being imported or exported. But basis this, en this entire argument only on a shallow level of understanding of CITES and what it actually constitutes. The level of this article is equal to something like climate change isn't real because it's snowing outdoors and medical masks don't work because I had to wear one and I still coughed. It's an article saturated with statements and facts that have been selectively mentioned in order to defend a certain point of view. The point of view that breeding butterflies and moths in captivity and the industry is rotten and that there is a world in which there is no emphasis or insight of what is being imported or exported. But basis this, en this entire argument only on a shallow level of understanding of CITES and what it actually constitutes. And here's more of my opinion that I've written down. Of course, every person who decides to own exotic pets has a shared responsibility when it comes to taking care of their animals. They do. This is my opinion. Breaking the law, smuggling or disturbing or catching protected species are not things that should ever be condoned or that I have ever advocated for. It doesn't matter if you own reptiles, butterflies or a dog or a cat. When exposed to our environment, these animals um, can have negative impacts. It's true, our exotic uh, pets, even a dog or a cat, they have negative impacts on the environment. And we as exotic pet owners do have a responsive, uh, collective responsibility to take care of our animals and be responsible with them in ways that doesn't harm their conservation and the environment. However, none of these concerns are unique to butterflies and moths alone. 
Legislation and conservation are important. And our environment is important. And for me and my viewers, we care deeply about it. It's the main motivation for doing the things all that I do. To contribute knowledge. This channel is not, making e this not even making money. I'm losing like $600 a month on this channel, despite all the crowdfunding that I get. So I'm not some, some, some rich, successful guy who is exploiting animals. The only reason I do any of this is because I think it helps the animals that I care about and their conservation. But when it's time to advocate for the species conservation, let's all agree to one thing. Let's listen to the real facts and information and not the confabulations of Sonja Pleumakers. Sonja, the article that you have written is a disgrace. It is a disgrace to journalism and it's going to be a disgrace to your career as a journalist. If you think it's okay to write things in a newspaper that incriminate people in ways which, which accuses them of breaking the law or exploiting animals for millions of people to read, you have to understand this has negative consequences. It has negative consequences for the people that you decide to write about. I don't care if you, for your school assignment, write a poorly researched article for your professor and you, you, you get like an, um, an F or maybe like a D for your project and you barely succeed. I don't care if you are a lazy journalist or a lazy college student, but it's different when you decide to publish this information in a newspaper that millions of people can read. And if I was just a simple hobbyist, this would be terrible for me, because a lot of people are going to read this and think negatively about me and see me as some kind of smuggler who is making money from animals and uh, exploits them. It's against everything I stand for and for the first time in like seven or eight years of breeding butterflies and moths, I feel angry. But Sonia, you made a mistake. I know that most people that you write about cannot de defend your, themselves from your article. When you write something like this about a hobbyist, there's no way for them to, for, to speak out or defend themselves from the media. But I, I, I get a lot of traffic and I'm going to make sure that uh, a lot of people are going to hear about you and your work. Um, I think it is more than reasonable to do that. I don't want to result to personal attacks, just her integrity as a journalist. More or less, any, every uh, claim in this article can be easily debunked, and I just wish that they would have listened to the actual experts. But it's clear that they're not interested in listening to experts or actually doing research, but more about finding selective pieces of information, stringing them together to make a narrative that is completely incorrect. And if people reserve the right to write things about me in the media that portray me in a negative light, despite my objections, then I, des I reserve the right to do the same. Normally, I would never make a video that contains somebody's name and title in it. But I think it's different when it's in a newspaper. I'm pretty sure the newspaper is going to be read by more people than the amount of people that are going to see this video in return. So at least, maybe then we're a little bit even. If somebody has ever worked with this journalist or is in touch with them, or if she approaches you for an interview, contact me first before talking with them. Or if you have a negative experience with this person, contact me as well. And we will see what we can do about it in the future. Writing things about people in the newspaper that can have negative repercussions based on misinformation should also have negative repercussion for the person who decided to publish it. Sonia wanted attention on the internet. And here's the attention that you wanted. Enjoy. This is the start of it. 
See you next time. And there's also an article about this on my website. Click the links in the description. I have a blog with a lot of readers where I write about how to be an entomologist, how to breed butterflies. Find out more information on my website. Click the link below and then you can read the article in the newspaper. See ya.